Okay. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Yeah, we're going to try this uh, whiteboard thing, but uh, I'm not sure how well it's going to work. And again, I'd like your feedback on this. Um, to me, it looks pretty bad because I have my laptop open. And it looks Looks a little blurry to me. They said they switched out the camera, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it looks um, odd. We'll try it. I'll try to write the board so that you can see. Uh, Hopefully. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, okay, so hopefully, but hopefully you can hear me um, a little bit better. Uh, but I suspect. Uh, I suspect that it might be better to just move online just because, you know, I mean, I really don't think uh, that the camera quality is quite good enough in this room. Anyway, um, yeah, we'll see. But in any case, recitation today uh, will be at 430 and it will just be on Zoom. I'll be in my office. Um, we couldn't really find a good time. For everyone, so uh, we'll just alternate between Tuesdays and Wednesdays, and uh, it'll always be at four thirty. And what else? Yeah, I don't know. So, so there's what is four <laughs> four of you here today. So, I mean, most of you are online. I think it's probably better to move online, but. Uh, just let me know. Just shoot me an email, you know, tell me how you feel about it. I, it's nicer to use the whiteboard, but I promise I'm not terrible at doing the tablet thing as long as uh, I, I can just sort of sit in my office and sort of have things a little bit better arranged. It's harder to do in here, especially with the mask. It's sort of, um, by the way, online people, you should be able to just ask questions and it should It'll project to the classroom so we can hear you. But okay, let's get started. Well, we'll see how it goes again. We're just experimenting. Um, so last time we were doing this intro to uh, sort of history of quantum mechanics. And we went over all these sizes, the universe to uh, size of a proton. And, you know, the realm of quantum mechanics begins sort of around this uh, length scale around the length scale of an insect, especially a virus. This is where you start to see uh, interference phenomena and really weird quantum effects. And historically, the origins of quantum mechanics go back to Max Planck's study of black body radiation. And it's really not surprising that light was sort of plays the first major role in uh, establishing quantum mechanics because a lot of the weirdness associated with quantum mechanics, like interference, you know, the two slit experiment, that is really pretty easily understood in terms of electromagnetic radiation, right? There's nothing strange about uh, having an interference pattern for light, but it is kind of strange to have an interference pattern for um, massive particles shooting electrons or uh, even viruses through two slits and observing that they interfere uh, in terms of where they land on a screen. That's weird. And, but it, it sort of depends on your perspective, right? Um, it, it's weird and it isn't weird because it's not so weird when we're talking about electromagnetic radiation, but those are particles too. In 1905, Einstein showed that to explain the photoelectric effect you basically have to consider light as being composed of uh, particles with a particular energy, um, h bar omega, or uh, h divided by the wavelength of the light. And in 1924, de Broglie postulated that a similar relationship arises uh, for massive particles, that their momentum of the massive particle is related to Planck's constant divided by uh, some wavelength, some wave-like property of the massive particle. 
and that's sort of the birth of quantum mechanics, uh, at least the phenomenology of it. And then by the 30s, basically all of the uh, major formalism of quantum mechanics that we will be developing uh, uh, was, was already developed. So by the 1930s, uh, QM formalism was kind of born. Um, people like uh, von Neumann and Bohr, that, that was sort of, um, was already developed at that point by sort of the end of the 30s. Um, so, and that's, that's where we'll start is with the kind of formalism associated with describing quantum mechanical systems. It'll be very mathematical in the beginning, but we'll eventually get to applications. But before we get there, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of what happened uh, in this time period, sort of between 1905 and 1930. Um, wanted to briefly mention the Bohr atom. So uh, this is 19. 13, uh, the Bohr atom. And the Bohr atom is a model for an electron in an atom. And what was found is that uh, if you observe, this is hydrogen, uh, people observed uh, radiation emitted from uh, from atoms, and what we find is that um, the radiation that's emitted comes out only in particular at particular frequencies. Um, we sort of understand this already that the energy of a photon that's coming out is just going to be related to the difference in energy levels of electrons that uh, are sitting in the in the atom, and that's where the emission spectrum comes from just the energy difference between an electron transitioning from one energy level, um, say dropping down from uh, one energy level to another. And it's uh, the difference in energies that's responsible for um, the frequency of light that's emitted. Um, just through this relationship that the photon energy is h bar omega, as we kind of discussed last time. And the idea of um, the Bohr atom is that you can imagine these electrons having spherical orbits in the atom. And so the postulate is that maybe this wavelength has to fit inside the circular orbit, this classical orbit, an integer number of times. So. If you have some orbit with uh, um, a radius A, some circular orbit, then uh, the circumference of that circle has to fit an integer number of wavelengths, where n is, of course, um, the number of times the wavelength fits in there. And this is just a postulate that doesn't have, has very little physical content other than the fact that. Uh, well, if massive particles have some wavelength associated with them, then you know that wavelength has to be meaningful. And so, if an electron is orbiting around, then you know maybe you know that wavelength should presumably fit into the orbit. Um, but this is all very hand wavy, and we'll just you know we'll see how it actually works later. But this is you know the Bohr atom, and miraculously the Bohr this simple model. This just assumption here gives you the exact spectrum for hydrogen, as it turns out. Um, it's not true for other atoms, but it worked for this particular case. And so you can combine this with another physical insight, namely that um, as the electron is whizzing around here, the kinetic energy which is the mass of the electron, v squared. This is from, from Newton's law. Just combine this for Newton's law, classical law. 
for um, circular orbits that mv squared over the radius of the orbit has to be equal to the actual the coulomb force between the uh, proton and the electron and so the charge of the electron squared proton also has the same charge divided by this uh, um, uh, electromagnetic uh, susceptibility for pi epsilon naught primitivity rather and then divided by a squared this is just the uh, the distance between them this is from the coulomb this is the kinetic part and these have to balance and we can define instead of writing over four pi epsilon naught a bunch this quantity is often denoted by e squared like that and then just equal to that. And so from here, we can solve um, for A. And what do we get? We get uh, E squared over ME V squared. And now, of course, we go back to here, and we can use De Broglie's relationship for um, the wavelength, right, in terms of the momentum. And this over here is just um, NH over MEV. That's just you know from the momentum. So now we can take this, solve it for V, and um, so you can combine these two things, these two equations, and in the end you get you can eliminate V. And you get an expression just for a, which is kind of amazing. You get like just a number, like a, a value for a, just from this physical argument. And what's the value? Well, it's um, uh, h bar squared over m e e squared times n squared. So for each n, you get a larger and larger orbit, right? Um, and these are the Bohr sort of energy levels also. Um, and of course, you can figure out what the energy levels are because all you have to do is combine the kinetic and the potential. The kinetic is one half mv squared. The potential is just the Coulomb potential, which is E squared over A. And that is, um, you just plug in for A, you plug in for V over there. Um, and what you get is minus uh, ME. You get an e to the fourth, and then there's an e squared in the a, and this v squared gives you another e squared squared. So you get e to the fourth over two h bar squared n squared. And this is often written as um, the Rydberg constant, r infinity, over n squared. So, um, what is this? This is some number. You can actually calculate what the, I guess you guys don't see that. Hold on a second. Okay, it's a little better. All right, so this, this is actually a number. This is a, a scale. Useful to know. So for, there's two things to, 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 uh, to recognize. First of all, this quantity here is a length, of course because this is just a number, so this has to be a length. This is the Bohr radius. And you can plug in the uh, numbers and it comes out to the 0.53 angstroms. All right. And that is about the size of um, an atom. So good, we got back out an atomic scale just from this very simple argument um, for the wavelengths. And you also get a um, an energy scale for you know typical energetic 
the size of atomic transitions, the Rydberg constant, and this thing is 13.6 um, electron volts. Uh, these are very important numbers to keep in mind because this is sort of the atomic scale where things really become quantum mechanical and we'll spend a lot of time thinking about the scale. And again, the energy scale is about, you know, 10 electron volts or so, and uh, the length scale is about an angstrom, you know, half an angstrom. If you want to know uh, a little bit more sort of intuition of what these energy scales are, another important energy scale you should keep in mind, you know, sort of in physics in general, um, is KT for like room temperature. We're sitting in this room, you know, constantly being bombarded with air molecules that has a characteristic energy scale of kt which is uh 1 40th of an electron volt uh, very good number to remember because you see this is going to be much bigger so that's good that means that under room temperature conditions conditions, so this is room temperature. Um, under room temperature conditions, you don't get uh, spontaneous, you know, emission of uh, light from uh, various gas molecules around us. It's not, uh, gas atoms around us. So it's not happening, so that's good. Uh, we don't have spontaneous ionization, you know, of uh, particles in the room. And this very simple argument just gives you a kind of rough scale of, um, um, atomic phenomena, and it's kind of amazing because it says that basic quantum mechanics tells you what the atomic scale is, right? It, it's sort of, we, we basically by doing nothing, we sort of derive what the size of a uh, atom should be. So that, that's surprising. It was sort of one of the first, you know, huge achievements of quantum mechanics is to use this kind of simple argument to um, figure something out about uh, atomic phenomena is really amazing and surprising that it works because you know now you can use this these are the energy levels right now we can plug that back into here for different energy levels calculate the difference and get the emission spectrum of uh, of uh, hydrogen atoms so that's uh, that's quite cool and uh, probably one of the first big achievements of quantum mechanics so this is all hand wavy. We don't have any formalism to understand this. We just use this simple argument that uh, the wavelength has to fit in an integer number of times. Um, okay. So any questions about that? This very simple bore atom picture. Right, it's completely hand wavy. We, you know, we need to develop the formalism to understand why it works the way it works. Um, okay, good. We're good. <laughs> okay. Online people, you're good. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right, well, so uh, during recitation, I'll talk about some, some other stuff related to this. Um, but, uh, okay, so the last bit of intro that I want to do uh, just jumping off of this Bohr atom business is this idea that um, the speed of light, the mass of the electron, and h or h bar, they give us uh, scales, right? They give us energy and uh, length scales. So we now have at our disposal H bar, right? Which we didn't have before, but now we have it because Max Planck studied uh, black body radiation and then Einstein studied the photoelectric effect and found 
So there's this proportionality constant for the kinetic energy of electrons that come out of a piece of material that's being uh, radiated with electromagnetic radiation proportional to the frequency of the light that comes in and the constant of proportionality was this h bar that connects you know the frequency of the light to uh, the energy of the electron so we've got this thing we also have you know in principle the mass of the electron as something we can use to construct different scales so we already saw how we can use the Bohr atom to construct you know the Rydberg energy scale and the uh, Bohr radius but uh, you know we can that involved uh, electromagnetism right I snuck in the electron charge in there but with just h bar the mass of the electron and the speed of light you can already construct uh, you know any physical unit that you want you know a, an energy scale a time scale and a uh, a length and these are the so-called uh Planck uh scales you know um same Planck as, as the black body and the kind of fundamental unit of length you just use unit analysis to combine these in the appropriate fashion and what you get is uh h bar over the mass times c that gives you a length and what is this length it's 0 0.00386 angstroms that's really small much smaller than the atomic scale we we're looking at again because we didn't bring electromagnetism in yet this is just using these three guys um and then there's a uh, uh, characteristic time that we can construct and that's just of course dividing through by c again we'll convert uh, the length to a time and that's a very uh, short time 1.29 times 10 to the minus 21 seconds and there's also a uh, energy scale which is the mass of the electron c squared and this is this rest energy that's uh I messed up last time it's half an MeV or 5.11 uh, times 10 to the 5 EV. So in some sense, it's a very large energy scale because uh, it's much larger than the Rydberg, which is just like you know, 10. Um, and these are the kind of fundamental, uh, you could say, distances and energy scales of quantum mechanics and everything else you have to add in some new ingredients. So for atomic phenomena, yeah, is there a question? Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, a, I'm pretty sure that, so I, I, yeah, that's, that's a good point. I don't, I have to go back and check what people exactly mean by the Planck length. You might be right about that, but I'm just saying that with just these three quantities at our disposal, that's what you can construct as a length. Uh, you might be you right. the question for us because we can hear it. Well, I have to think about it. I mean, uh, this is certainly much smaller than. Um, um, yeah. If I remember correctly, the Planck Planck was derived at the po smallest possible um, size that a black hole could exist. Yeah, you might be right, but then again, those are bringing. That's bring, So again, that, that's so that's yeah, that's that's right. So that's what I'm saying. These are sort of the fundamental units that don't involve any forces. Uh, and then you have to add another ingredient, which is typically some coupling. And then it's the coupling that kind of tells you the associated length scale of whatever it is you're talking about, whether it's the strong force. For the electromagnetic force, it's a very small coupling. Uh, we'll see alpha. And that corrects these fundamental units back to the correct atomic scale. And you know, this 
when you take this and you divide it by the small coupling constant, you get back out the Bohr radius, for instance. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll check. I'm, anyone online can chime in too, I, but uh, pretty, pretty sure that, unless I calculated this incorrectly, but I think that's right. Um, and that's what you can construct using the, just the mass of the electrons, H bar and C. So these are the wrong atomics, of course. And so what you need is a coupling, uh, a unitless number, so just a number. And it turns out that for electromagnetism, which is the ingredient you need to connect back to uh, atomic phenomena, this is about one over 137. People spend a lot of time thinking about why it's that particular number. But what this is is just E squared, as I defined before, over H bar C. So it connects up uh, charge and uh, photons. Um, I'll tell you what, where this comes from in a moment, but this is just a number. This is a unitless thing. It's 1 over 137. If you want it in terms of more of sort of SI units, uh, it's the charge of the electron squared over 4 pi is permittivity guy, um, H bar C. And what it is, is it's just a comparison between the Coulomb energy of two electrons that are some distance D apart, and then a photon, which has some wavelength, uh, 2 pi D. And if you compare the energy of the electromagnetic energy of these guys and the energy of this photon, what you get is alpha. I can show you that. Um, alpha is um, the Coulomb energy associated with uh, those two electrons, a distance d apart. This is just q squared over d. And then you divide that by the uh, photon energy, which is uh, H C over lambda, which I said is two pi D. And uh, you get back out uh, this thing. Let me scan a little bit. So, uh, and this thing is then what allows you to connect back up these fundamental units to the atomic ones, for instance, the Bohr radius now is just um, h bar squared over me e squared as we saw before. And that's nothing but one over alpha uh, times this, maybe I shouldn't call it Planck then. Well, times this fundamental unit of, of length, we'll call it ln. Uh, and the Rydberg, the Rydberg is um, is this. the the Rid the Rydberg is basically. Uh, uh, let's see. Well, it's. Um, one half alpha squared. You can go back to the definition of the Rydberg and see how alpha fits in there. Alpha squared, um, MEC squared. So that if you get suppression of the sort of fundamental energy scale MEC squared by alpha squared over two. And you can play these games. This is just unit analysis. Um, you just go back to the atomic scale units and see how many powers of alpha you have to include in order to connect them back up to these more fundamental units. And um, basically, so that's another feature, right, of quantum mechanics that's sort of important to recognize is that it provides you these fundamental scales. And then all of physics is just basically figuring out some, the effects of some coupling. For instance, uh, the electromagnetic coupling between a photon and a, an electron, the associated sort of 
um, the difference in energy scales between um, a photon and an electron. For the strong force, there's also an associated strong force coupling, uh, where instead of the photon, you have um, gluons, and instead of the electrons, you have the quarks. And basically, all of physics fits into this umbrella, uh, which is really brought into kind of full fruition when we study quantum field theory, where this idea of the coupling really starts to make a lot more sense. And you recognizes all of physics as just being different uh, um, field Lagrangians that you can construct. But it's this idea still comes it comes still come from comes from quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics gives you access to these fundamental units, and then all of the physics is just um, the effects of some interaction between uh, force carrying a particle and, and you know the charge carrying particle. So and you can do a lot with just unit analysis. All of that Bohr atom stuff is a very simple physical argument, and the rest is just unit analysis. So that plays also an important role. Um, and so you can get really far with these kind of quote unquote hand wavy arguments. But that's where we're going to stop with that. And then we're going to develop a whole mathematical formalism to eventually get us back to where we kind of started with the hand wavy argument, but we'll have at least. Um, some uh, mathematical tools to kind of build a you know a more formal kind of axiomatic picture of quantum mechanics. But you know, for now, I should recognize that uh, you know, with uh, the advent of quantum mechanics, you get access to this new quantity h bar, which provides you with a whole set of scales. And then you can connect those scales up to the physics that you know, like electromagnetism, strong force, and, and so on. Oh, I think I know how to answer your question now. The Planck, when you say Planck units, that refers to connecting up these guys to the gravitational force. So you have to now include the gravitational constant, right? And that will really mess things up because there's a huge disparity between these scales and then gravitational scales which you know are like bigger than human scale right? they're sort of <laughs> right they're, they're at the scale of um so so that, yeah and so that that'll that'll make this much much smaller it's sort of yeah yeah so so yeah that, that's right so so usually when people say plank units they refer to the ones that are constructed also with the gravitational constant uh good so all right good the thing i remembered that was <laughs> All right. Any questions though from online folks? Um, all right. So I'll take a little breather, and uh, we're gonna start on the actual formalism. So it, we won't connect back up to this physics for a while. And that's OK. I mean, it, it takes a lot of time to sort of develop enough of the formalism where you see where all this stuff comes from without just this kind of hand wavy plugging in the de Broglie wavelengths and just going from there. I mean, if you were to do things correctly, right? Like for the Bohr atom, what would you do? Well, you would start with um, the actual Coulomb interaction between the electron and the proton. And you would try to treat that quantum mechanically. And you would try to understand the electron and the proton themselves quantum mechanically. So it's, so, you know, that's what you need to do instead of this um, quasi classical analysis. And so it's where we begin is just we jump straight into the quantum mechanical world where um, 
you know, kind of space of states is quite different. It's uh, so this is now in Belloc, it's chapter two, Sakurai, it's the uh, first couple of sections where it starts on uh, bras and caps and things like that. Um, but I like the Belloc book because it just develops the formalism um, right away without uh, kind of secretly tying in these kind of hand wavy uh, physics arguments. Um, the kind of mathematical world space, you'd say, in which quantum mechanics lives is uh, so called Hilbert space. And that's where we'll start with the Hilbert space. And I use this capital, squiggly H, to uh, denote the Hilbert space. And it's a vector space. It's a, uh, a complex vector space. And I do mean vectors, the kind that you know, you know, a vector, maybe linear algebra, you know, you would write it in some components, right? This is a three dimensional vector. Well, in the quantum mechanics, it's a complex vector space. So uh, these guys are allowed to have complex values, have real and imaginary parts. And we denote elements instead of writing this vector like this. In the Hilbert space, we use caps. And this is a vector inside the Hilbert space, which I write like this, it's an element of H. And it's got all sorts of properties that you would want it to have uh, as a vector space. First of all, you can, uh, take any complex constant and that's, you know, with real and imaginary parts. So it, in general, it'll be some complex constant, any constant, real and imaginary parts, uh, you know, lives in the complex plane, which we often write um, like this where we put the real part along X and imaginary part along Y. So it lives in this two dimensional space. Any such constant, we can take our vector, multiply it by a constant. And maybe we can call this a new vector, which is just the original one multiplied by that constant. You can imagine multiplying all the elements by uh, that constant. And well, that better be in uh, the Hilbert space too. So, your Hilbert space has to contain the vectors and any constant multiplied by those vectors. That's one property. Um, the next one, the important one is you must also must also contain any linear combination. So if you have two vectors, oh, getting cut off in the Hilbert space right, then you better be sure that uh, this linear combination is also in the Hilbert space. That's another fundamental property of uh, the Hilbert space. What else do we have? Well, we have the associative property, namely that you can group linear combinations um, together however you want. And so if you have three vectors, you know, one, two, three in your Hilbert space, then it doesn't matter if you first combine the first two into something that's in the Hilbert space and then add it to a third one, or if you take the first one and add it to whatever you get when you add the Uh, when you add the other one. And these things may seem sort of obvious, but they're, by developing this formalism, when all the weird stuff happens in quantum mechanics, we'll be sort of less confused 
because we'll have this as a kind of handle. And I haven't even told you what the Hilbert space is and what these vectors are. But basically what we'll see is that in quantum mechanics, any state of a system, the amount of information that is sort of available in that uh, system, in any particular state of it at any given time, that's fully captured by one of these vectors. And then when we do things like take measurements, we'll see that what we're doing is, um, is we're simply acting on these vectors. We're transforming them with some uh, transformations and taking them some other vectors. And uh, well, we'll get there eventually. But uh, for now, you can think about the Hilbert space as the collection of uh, states of a quantum mechanical system and anyone and a vector if you have a system then the state of that system everything we could possibly know about it measure about it is captured by you know one of these vectors so that's that's all we need for now and now we're just going to develop this mathematical formalism and uh see, see where it takes us um so okay so now we have these uh three properties constant linear combination, this associative property. Uh, and there's another important part, which will um, get us to uh, understanding what happens when you measure something about the quantum mechanical system. And that's this whole Hilbert space. I mean, I didn't say why it's Hilbert. So far, this is just what you would get for a complex, um, complex vector space. But the Hilbert part, there's an extra feature. It's not only that you just add, you know, and multiply these by constants and add them together, you can also form an inner product. And that, that's really the special feature of a Hilbert space. Um, that we'll talk about, uh, that we'll talk about now. So that, that's the Hilbert part is the uh, inner product. Any questions though so far? You guys can still hear me. I also see the chat, so if you type anything in chat, I think I will see it. Uh, okay. So an inner product is something that takes a pair of vectors, and for each pair of vectors, it gives you a number, a complex number. And so, what, what, so if you have any two vectors, pi and uh, phi in your Hilbert space, their inner product, which we denote by um, this notation is a complex number. It's an element of the complex numbers. And it's, it has um, certain linearity uh, properties. Now, in physics, we often ignore this kind of development and we just say, well, this is, you know, like some kind of, you know, this is like a, a row and column vector. You know, this is a kind of row vector, and we kind of dot it into uh, another vector v two. So you know, you take the row and column vector and you dot them together, and that's what the inner. But it's not really like that. The formal development is you have a space of vectors. They have those properties I showed you before. These three properties. Um, there, there's some more, but uh, those are the major ones. Um, but And then there's an extra thing, which is that you can take any pair and connect them to a complex number. And that inner product has certain properties. Um, it's got the linearity property, which is um, the important thing. 
So if you have, if you take an inner product between some chi vector and then a linear combination of two vectors, phi one plus lambda phi two, and now you can you have to imagine that I'm you know putting these these are vectors, so you can imagine I just sort of putting them in uh, little bras here. It's kind of awkward notation, but that's sometimes I'll drop the test just we have to remember that it, they're vectors, they're not numbers. This is a linear combination of vectors. It's got this linearity property that the inner product distributes over linear combinations. Of vectors and the constant comes out too. So you get uh, pi phi one plus lambda pi phi two. This is called uh, the linearity of the inner product. There's also uh, an anti linearity property, which is where uh, people get into a lot of trouble in terms of calculations, as we'll see. But if you lay it out like this, um, hopefully you won't get tripped up by it. And if if um, so, it, it's it's if you take uh, the inner product between phi and then so it's a kind of direct. It depends on which order you pick the pair. So if it's this and the inner product with a linear combination of pi one plus lambda pi two. Then, when it's an inner product like that, um, then what happens is when you distribute this out, you pull out the complex conjugate of uh, of the constant. That's very important. So you don't just pull out a constant; you pull out uh, lambda star phi two phi. When you take the inner product in the opposite order. Uh, and this is called anti-linearity. And people go uh, tripped up by this a lot uh, because you see it under a different disguise when you're actually doing physics problems. But, um, well, so I wrote it twice. Well, it's good to so remember it. So um, when you take the inner product in the opposite order, then you pull out a complex conjugate. And of course, just to remind you, the complex conjugate of lambda is you know the real part of lambda minus the imaginary part. Um, if you haven't seen complex numbers, email me. I assume you've seen them. You've seen complex numbers at some point. Good. All right. Thanks for saying something. You know, it's okay if you haven't. We can we can go over it in uh, recitation and uh, and so forth. So okay, so you have this anti-linearity. And um, it's got some more properties. Uh, another one is if um, is if um, so. Let's I guess label these. I guess property one. And let me just give this a title. I guess this is inner product. This is what makes it a Hilbert space, really. Got this anti-linearity property. Property three is um, if um, if the inner product between so property three basically is if you take the inner product of a vector with itself, then that thing is uh, always uh, greater than or equal to zero. We'll prove this actually. This is not really, it's just a property. It's not really a postulate or anything. You can prove it. Um, and moreover, if phi inner product with itself is equal to zero, if you ever are in that situation, then phi itself has to be uh, zero. I should write. Uh, the zero vector. It's kind of like, morally speaking, a vector with zeros in all the entries. Um, and that's an important property. And the zero vector is important because, and it's really, it's also a property of this Hilbert space, 
that every um, that there's an identity vector, meaning that um, well, let me. Let me pull this down a little bit and continue adding to here that there is an identity uh, vector, which is the zero vector. And if you add the zero vector to any uh, other vector, you just get back out the uh, original vector itself. Um, So there's a special zero vector that exists. And related to that, of course, it means there's an inverse for every vector. Um, we're running out of room here, you guys can see. So there's property four, there's a zero vector or the identity. And I guess you can say there's property five related to that. Uh, for any phi in the Hilbert space, right, there is an inverse, there is a minus phi, um, such that when you add it to the phi, you get, you know, the zero vector. And that, that's another property. Like what there exists. Um, Okay, so those are the kind of properties, and um, you have this inner product that takes pairs of vectors and connects them to a real number. Uh, so, sorry, complex number, and it has these properties of linearity and antilinearity. And we'll talk more about this norm soon. Uh, but now we're going to talk about. Um, basis decomposition. So again, this is a vector space. So uh, we can find a basis for the space. And I'll talk about that now. But any questions just about the general scheme of the space? Just like regular vectors, except we have complex entries. And there's also this inner product, which is kind of like a complex generalization of the dot product, if you want, between vectors. But not quite, because, you know, of this weird linearity, anti-linearity business. It's where it matters what order you take them in, right? For a vector, like you just do v1 dot v2, it doesn't matter. You don't have the anti-linearity property, basically. Uh, okay. We good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, th that's right. I, so I guess you can define a norm, presumably independently of the inner product. I, I forget the exact mathematical. Um, um, yeah. So, so. All right. So, so my recollection is the reason it's a Hilbert space and not just a complex vector space is because specifically of the inner product uh, and its peculiarities. Now, I'm not, you, you can correct me on that. If you, if, <laughs> if some math book finds me different, it finds it, says it's different, that might be right. But th that's my recollection. In any case, I think I've sort of laid out all the properties. So hopefully, um, And, and this, you know, this kind of brings up again something I mentioned last time, which maybe now you can will be able to better appreciate now a little bit. We'll see more later. Is why sort of undergrad quantum mechanics kind of does things backwards because, um, as we'll see, it's when you think about quantum mechanical states as vectors. It's much easier to think about like a you know a three entry 
vector, two entries, a finite dimensional vector with a you know fixed number of dimensions, three dimensions, two dimensions. But as soon as you have something like a particle living on a line, uh, <laughs> that's an infinite dimensional space where you have a vector with an infinite number of entries. And that messes up the mathematical structure in certain ways, not in all ways. Mostly it'll, quantum mechanics deals with very nicely behaved infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but uh, you know, it's still just not nice. So it's easier to work with like a three by three or two by two matrix. Um, and all of the kind of weirdness associated with spatial wave functions and things you do there uh, kind of sweeps a lot of that uh, Hilbert space math under the rug. And that's why in this class, we'll be starting with the finite dimensional Hilbert space and building up to the infinite dimensional one. So then you uncover all the stuff that was sort of swept under the rug in your undergrad class, presumably. Yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, Professor, exactly. can you repeat the yeah, question? So a particle in a box, right, has an infinite number of, of possible energy levels. Exactly right. Well, even in a finite box, it, it gets even, even funnier, right? Because sometimes you can get a continuous part of your spectrum. And then it gets really tricky because then it's, uh, we'll see it still corresponds to a countable infinity in terms of the dimension of the Hilbert space. But if you have a countable infinity of uh, dimensions, it, it's, it means you can still get continuous portions of your energy spectrum. We'll get there, that's later. But uh, um, but for now, we're gonna deal with uh, finite dimensional spaces, right? We're gonna do finite, uh, dimensional Hilbert space H, where we're going to say, well, the dimension is just some N. And the N will be like two or three. And when you have that, it's just, so again, morally speaking, it's like having uh, vectors, you know, this would be, you know, however many components you have, just, just like, but it, again, it's morally speaking, it's not exactly that. Again, it's a complex space, it's an inner product, et cetera. But just like these guys, so these are already written in a basis, right? Where we mean something by each entry, like it's the component along the X direction, the Y direction, the Z direction, those are the basis vectors for this three dimensional or two dimensional space. Whenever you have a finite dimensional space like that, you can find a basis. Uh, there's a basis uh, decomposition of the space. Decomposition. It means that you can find a set of vectors. There may be multiple sets, you know, and it's like in the, oh, I think there's a chat question. Oh, the questions asked in class. Yeah, so, uh, sorry. Yeah, so the last uh, question that was asked was uh, if the, for the case of a particle on a line, what the infinite dimensional means, right? And it's uh, infinite dimensional, we'll see later that it's still, it's a countable number of dimensions. Like you can still count them one, two, three up to infinity. But, um, and generally speaking, the number of them corresponds to the sort of the energy levels, for instance, of um, say a particle in a harmonic oscillator potential. There you have an infinite number of energy levels, but we'll see when you have a countable infinity of dimensions, your energy spectrum can go continuous. You can have a continuous range of energies, uh, like for a, you know the kinetic energy of a free particle. So 
So you know, but we'll get there. It's in this, you know, so the, it was, the question was just related to my comment that in undergrad, you kind of do things backwards. You start with the most mathematically complicated situation. Uh, <laughs> and you kind of sweep all that nasty kind of technicality associated with them. You know, even like the spectrum of a free particle, like that's a weird thing. There's a continuous number of, there's a continuum of energies that it can have. And that makes things very difficult in the quantum mechanical world where the fundamental states are vectors in the Hilbert space. Um, but we'll see, we'll, we'll get there. But for now, it's just, we're still developing this formalism and we're gonna do finite dimensional stuff. The finite dimensions again, two, three, four, whatever. Probably won't be four. <laughs> Any homework is usually two or three. Um, incidentally, the two level, the, the two dimensional thing is, you know, often called a qubit. Um, we'll get there, we'll see all that. But um, the important thing is when you have a finite dimensional space like that, it always admits a basis decomposition. You can always find a set of vectors, which we'll call M, right? And the M ranges from one all the way up to your dimensions. You can always find that. And moreover, you can find it's a very special set where the it's a so-called orthonormal set. Uh, or the normal, it's got this condition that if you take the inner product between any pair of them, then the inner product is either one or zero. And it's uh, one if they're the same vector and otherwise it's zero. And a nice notation for that is just the Kronecker delta. It's a one if it is equal to m, zero otherwise. And you can use this set to decompose any vector. Um, so then for any phi in your Hilbert space, you can decompose it, you can expand it out um, in terms of this basis vector. So in terms of these basis vectors. So any phi is equal to a sum from one to n of complex coefficients. And these, these guys are in general complex. Complex coefficients. Uh, morally speaking, this is nothing but saying that uh, V1, V2, V3, for instance, is V1, some constant, times 1, 0, 0, V2, 0, 1, 0, V3, 0, 0, 1. Morally, eh, I'm going to put it in quotes. You know, this is only a rough analogy, but uh, these are sort of right the basis vectors along the XYZ direction, say. Uh, and you have some real coefficients here for a real vector space. Um, that's how you, you know, the displacements along those directions. So it's very similar to that. Uh, it's, but, you know, now we just have this different notation where it's the sum over, you know, this arbitrary number of them, complex coefficients times these basis vectors, right? So, that's nice. And we can use this now to uh, prove various things. Like we could prove that property that I have up here that, uh, okay, let's kind of see this. That uh, we can prove this now if we want. We can use this as a kind of tool. And in fact, in quantum mechanics problems, it's often what you do is you have a state of a system and then you decompose it into a basis and then all you're doing is you're calculating with these coefficients instead of the the vectors really sort of we'll see for two-dimensional 
systems. That could be a spin, for instance, spin one half uh, particle, and you know it, you could imagine a basis being uh, spin pointing up in the z direction or pointing down in the z direction. Uh, so we'll see, but you know we'll get there. First, we have to develop sort of the math. Um, were there any questions before? I, we're we're going to just use this basis decomposition to calculate various things. Like the norm, I'm going to prove some things about um, uh, these inner products, like the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality and things like that. It's two twenty-five, right? Last year, I uh, <laughs> I like <laughs> ended class ten minutes early for like the first half of the entire uh, semester. <laughs> no, no one said anything because I guess you know that I was being nice, but I just I just misremembering the time. Okay, good. So we're going to use this now to like prove, you know, this stuff. Maybe I'll leave this up here for now. Um, okay, so we can, uh, let, let's like calculate an inner product, right? You have a phi, you decompose it, right? You take some other vector, chi, you decompose that. Uh, in general, it'll have different coefficients, d. And now we take the inner product, chi, phi. Let me do this slowly, because uh, it'll show you how all the different properties of that I've been talking about um, work together. So this is a linear combination of these guys. So let me draw really big brackets. Um, put this sum over here. It's the inner product between that guy and this linear combination. Okay. So now we could do the linearity property, right? We could say, okay. And now it's a little bit awkward because this is a linear combination over here and this is a linear combination. So as always, when you're doing things like multiplying sums together, you have to make sure you don't get confused about the indices. This is a separate sum from this one. When you multiply two sums together, you get all the cross terms, right? So you maybe it's better to call this one M because it's just a dummy uh, variable. You're summing over all of them anyway. So let's use linearity. of the inner product. So for each of these, I can pull out the constant, right? And for each of these, it'll be a big thing where I take the inner product one to n, d, m, m, and the individual n now, right? That's linearity. Well, now I have to do anti-linearity because now I take the inner product in the opposite order. It's a linear combination and a vector. So, yeah. Anti-linearity. 
And I know this is very pedantic in a sense, uh, but I tell you what, people <laughs> get tripped up by this all the time. Like putting the complex conjugates in the right place and like thinking about, oftentimes people get really tripped up by the fact that when you take an inner product like this, it's like multiplying two sums together. So you need to make sure you get all the cross terms right. Uh, okay, but using anti-linearity, we can pull out Um, we can pull out the sum over M. And now when we pull out the constant, it comes in as a complex conjugate. Well, now we're left with an inner product between M and N. And now we can use this property over here, right? Now we can do something and we can say this is zero unless M is equal to N. And then in that case, you know, the only terms that get left over, so this is the orthonormality uh, property of the basis. Uh, you get this guy. The only terms I contribute is when M is equal to N. So uh, we've turned our inner product into just a sum over a bunch of complex numbers multiplied together. Um, and you know, it's a little bit like saying morally, morally you're taking like V1 star, V2 star, V3 star and dotting it into V1, V2, V3. A little bit, it's a little bit like that. Because this would also be, you know, V1 star V1 plus V2 star V2 plus V3 star V3. But I'm putting this, this is all in quotes. Maybe I should, I should use another color or something. This is like wrong, I should never, really think about it that way but maybe kind of think about it that way i don't know but uh this is definitely the formalism we'll use but you can keep in the back of your mind at least for finite dimensional things this won't get you into any trouble really because it's kind of just like a vector space where you take dot products one of the things is just complex conjugated and that's what's happening here right these coefficients of the chi guy ended up getting complex conjugated. Okay, uh, questions about that? This is like the, uh, online people. Uh, okay, well, we still got a little bit of time. So I'm gonna start on this calculation. Um, so incidentally, this lets you, oh, so it, now it's easy to see th this kind of thing, right? This, the proof of this is easy. Okay. Why? Because just from this formula, you see that uh, phi dotted into phi inner product is just the sum of the coefficients uh, Cn star Cn. Right, and Cn star Cn is nothing but uh, the magnitude of Cn squared. You sum all those up, and that, by definition, is the sum over positive numbers. So this is greater than or equal to zero. Moreover, if it's zero, then all of these have to be zero, because otherwise, you know, I mean, these are all positive. So if the whole thing is zero, so if if phi, phi is equal to zero, then uh, all the CNs are zero. And if all the CNs are zero, then the whole vector is just a zero vector. So that is easy proof. Next time we'll do a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which is like a much fancier um, manipulation here. And I'll be skipping a lot of these steps. You should 
and for the first homework, we'll be getting some practice and just doing this kind of manipulation um, and getting used to this notation as opposed to this kind of thing, which you're probably more familiar with from linear algebra, but sort of practicing with these broad and cuts. Um, yeah, that's a good place to stop, I think. Um, yeah, tonight at 4.30, I'll be in my Zoom thing, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, linear algebra, some review. Because again, you know, it'll be important to remember matrices, you know, taking eigen, getting eigenvalues, eigenvectors, this kind of thing comes up. So that's, we'll talk about that and I don't know, whatever, whatever you like, it's really kind of open. So I have the homework, the homework will be posted uh, tomorrow night and it'll be due two weeks from Thursday. 